quite a few years ago. It's called Daisy and Ondell. Tree swallows fill the air with their acrobatics. A flock of at least 3,000 scours the breeze for the last flashings of the sun on insect wings. Before the night, when they return to the autumn migration, they separate into three hunting packs, flying a circuit from fresh pond over the maple swamp and adjoining fields, circling back down to the mirror surface of the water. The mirror is still, except for the ripples where the swallows dip their beaks to catch water striders. The slanting rays of the disappearing day turn flittering wings into indigo glimmerings, wheeling and soaring amid tittering laughter. I lay down in the meadow to enjoy this circus and meditate upon life. The voice I raise in the cosmic chorus, rising and falling in a fathomless music, the breath of our united spirit. I pour every drop of my consciousness into perception to expand my awareness, freeing myself of the illusions that separate me from nature. I am one with the swift dancing Daisy Rondel, the intricate path they weave through twilight. I am one with the earth cradling me, holding me to the sky, that I may see the cold beauty of the stars and my shadow in the moon's light. I am one with the love life embodies, and here we are, communing, sharing the essence of our thought, conspiring the universe in these halting words. The manager of the Sierra Club uh, chapter in Rhode Island and um, an activist in many areas the author of a book of poetry, Durandell, and my husband. <laughs> thank you. Um, and firstly, of course, I want to thank Amber for uh, leading the worship service. Um, and I want to thank Helene as well for um, making it all happen. When she invited me to speak this summer, I think it was back maybe even in the winter, uh, I didn't hesitate to say yes. Um, and the time between then and now has flown by. Um, and I don't know where it all <laughs> went, to be honest. But uh, I'll, I'll sort of go through that process, actually, because I think it helps inform what I'll be discussing during the sermon today. And uh, I do, I do want to preface everything. I'm, I'm not a sermonizer normally, I'm not used to preaching, and although I'm preaching to the choir here, I know um, I'm typically much more frequently talking in a conversational tone, so that'll probably come across. Uh, forgive me for that. Um, so when Helene first approached me about doing the sermon, I said, yes, um, I didn't really know what I would be talking about. Um, months passed. She's like, do you remember you said you were going to do the sermon? I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, so, I went, what's your topic? And, you know, just like, on the spot here. And the first thing that came into my mind was um, transcendentalism. It's um, sort of the root of where I approach environmentalism from. I, I thought it, it made sense to discuss it, of course, in, in a Unitarian Universalist. Uh, congregation, and uh, I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it. So I'm going to talk about transcendentalism and environmentalism, and the spiritual nexus that, uh, that leads to my own activism. And I, again, sort of forgot about it in, in all the activities of my job. I'm very busy. Um, and But it was always in the back of my mind. And um, one of the things that happened this year, uh, as part of my job, I organized uh, the Earth Day Lobby Day at the State House. And I was at the State House a lot this year, a lot more than last year. And one of the things I noticed, I think there are a lot of great causes to go up to the State House and, and lobby about. And 
uh, you know, standing on the side above. You can see the rot rotunda filled, or, or workers' rights. You can see the rotunda filled, um, homeless advocacy. You get the rotunda filled with, with advocates and, and people there um, standing up for very important causes. And as the main organizer for the environmental lobby day, I was a little disappointed because we don't fill the lobby. We don't fill the rotunda. We get 30 people there, maybe. And, you know, I, I wonder why. Um, and uh, I wanted to try and answer that today. Um, hopefully find a, a place where we will start filling, filling the state house up and, and carrying that message to our, to our political leaders. Um, and so I was thinking about that. Well, why, why aren't people here? Why isn't the advocacy there? Um, I tried to say, well, it's because we have such strong advocates already there. We have great environmentalists, um, Save the Bay, Sierra Club, Clean Water Action. The job is already being done. Um, but I don't think that's, that's what it is, really. Um, and I, I thought about it harder. I said, you know, I, I, th I think it comes down in large part to the fact that we're part of a culture um, that runs contrary to environmentalism. You know, a culture that demands overconsumption, uh, the production of a serious amount of waste that our environment can't handle. And if we go and we argue for our environmental claims, we're arguing against our very way of life. And I thought, yeah, that, that sounds good. This is what I'll talk about in, in the sermon. And I'll, I'll bring in transcendentalism here. And we'll talk about how transcendentalism can, can cure this uh, fixation on consumption. And, uh, and But, you know, again, I, I, I didn't feel like that really got to, to the essence of the matter. And I thought there's, there's even a deeper, deeper problem that we face. And it's, it goes back to the very first stories, some of the things that we talk about more in church. And there's the uh, story in Genesis, of course, being cast out of the Garden of Eden. And what is that original sin? And even before that, to the, to the creation story, in the beginning, uh, there was the word. And I think this is what all my thought, you know, before I was an environmentalist, when I was just a philosopher and a poet, um, this is what I try to get out of my writings, this is what I try to get out of my way of life, that the, the crucial problem for humanity, for us, for individuals, for us as a, as a whole, as a culture, and as a society, um, comes down to our ability and it is a great ability to separate ourselves from nature. And that was, you know, that, that fundamental biting into the, the fruit of knowledge. Now we can see the difference between us and nature. Or when we created the Word, or when God created the Word, that is when that initial separation was made. And it's, a, it's an important, you know, step forward to be able to conceptualize us is being separate from the rest of the universe. And it's you know, led to the development of languages, uh, theories, institutions. Our whole civilization is built upon our ability to manipulate the outside world um, and think of it as, as something outside of ourselves. And so I wanted to address that, because I think unless we're really looking at that root problem, that root instant when we separate ourselves from nature, we're not going to be um, addressing the real problem. We're not going to see those people at the state house. So, so that's, that's what came together in my mind and brought me here today to speak um, with, with this message. And I, I, I'm humbled to, you know, to be here and to speak about this in front of you because I think it's, it's, it's critically important to me to share it, but it's, I think it's important to be said.
And uh, I wear a number of hats, as you've heard. I, you know, <coughs> professional environmentalist, a, you know, a poet. Uh, I come from a religious tradition of uh, Quakerism. So again, uh, preaching does not come naturally to me. Um, but I'm gonna try and weave all these things, these themes together in, in this sermon. You'll hear me read some poetry. I'm hoping that we have time to do a little silent meditation at the end. Meditation is the tool that allows us to grasp that, that oneness and get away from that separation that we create between ourselves and nature. Um, so I'm hoping to do all those things. I know we have limited time. I've already lingered on this introduction much longer than I should have. I should also point out that I, I also, since we're addicted to this notion of us being separate from the universe, that that is the heart of what we do. Um, I, I framed it as you know, treating an addiction. And I had not been through a 12-step program myself, but I have used that framework, and forgive me, I do not mean to take it lightly or anything. So my my take on transcendentalism sort of rose. Uh, I, I read Emerson when I was in junior high, uh, which echoed a, a lot of my own personal philosophy that was out of um, my upbringing as a Quaker. And ever since then, you know, I, I go back and read Emerson regularly, um, Thoreau maybe a little less so. And my take on transcendentalism is sort of the, the Quaker take. We find this spirit that moves in everything, in us as much as it moves in that tree or the stone or the star that's 20 million light years away. And this force that moves in all of us um, can be understood, can be perceived by everyone. And I think transcendentalism is the philosophy that allows us to expand our, our concept of ourself, um, to look beyond the ego and our, you know, this is me, this is the rest of the universe. Transcendentalism is that philosophy which allows us to have a broader view of what the self is and expand it to the whole universe. And um, that's, that's the approach I take to transcendentalism, that's what I'll talk about here. So, the first thing, of course, is to realize we're addicted to this conceptualization of the universe. We have ourselves, our ego, the I, and the rest of it. And we need to recognize this addiction. It's, um, that's the first step. Um, not just to recognize it, um, but to admit that we're powerless to it to a degree. This is something that's arisen through genetics um, and through biology. Uh, we, we gain a lot by acting in a selfish manner. It's what allows us to preserve ourselves. Um, and so the first step in, in treating our addiction to our ego, our self, is, is to you know, know that we're powerless. It is a part of us. Um, but it's something that we can overcome through, through meditation and what happened with it, through that. And uh, I think I have, I have a poem here that it speaks to this issue, so I'm going to read that. And this does not have a title. But Look at us. We are ill, but we deny our malady. We hide it behind ideas, words, phantom theories. The symptoms, though, remain inescapable. Violence, poverty, famine, ultimately war. We are ill, the sickness deep. It is a mental illness, a pathology that allows us to destroy life, one another. We are deranged, unabashedly rationalizing brutality. What makes us so? Alienation, atomization, 
isolation, our common condition, stems from the root fear that we are alone, trapped in boxes of ego, us versus the universe, and certain doom. It yields to materialism, the division of life from death, love from pain, us from else, and lastly, I from them. Fundamentally disassociated with the community of life and the laws of nature that govern survival. Dissociated and standing still, waiting for an idea to come and save us all. Our divisions are as ancient as abstraction and symbolism, born before humans at the dawn of consciousness. But the age of its invention does not validate our assumed divisions. The reality of the situation will forever be. We share an essential unity. There is this one moment in the infinity of its experience. Okay. Now, the uh, second step in our 12-step program to destroy the ego here is um, to admit that there is a greater power um, that can restore our sanity. And that greater power is, is this oneness that, we speak of, that Betty talks about frequently here. And to a degree, this is, this is sort of a false choice, um, I think, because we are part of that greater power. We are, we are the oneness. We are, you know, we expand to the edge of the universe, each of us individually. So as much as there is a, a greater power out there that can restore our sanity, that power is, is us. Number three, step three. Make a decision to turn our will over to that greater power. And again, um, this, this gets to that sort of false choice. We are always part of that, that greater will. Um, we, we confuse ourselves with illusions, with our, with our ideas of separateness. And um, all we really have to do is let go of those illusions in order to grant that greater will, that greater self power over us. Um, so I think what is actually happening as, as we approach the world through the transcendental mindset is uh, we're break, breaking the will free from the ego um, and, and letting the will be the will of the universe and the greater greater being of which we are all a part. Number four. Make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And, uh, it, you know, this is something we can all do every day, something we come here to do together uh, on Sundays. Um, the way that we can get to this, this place of oneness is by really <coughs> focusing our attention on those illusions that, that separate us from nature, separate us from, from the universe. And it can take a lot of different forms. It's, I think it always sort of comes under the rubric of meditation. There's prayer, there's yoga, uh, there's silently sitting on the beach and, and watching the waves roll in. Uh, there's music and breathing. Uh, there, are, there are a number of paths, and they've been discovered by countless cultures over the ages, and they, they all lead to this, to this same place, this feeling of oneness, this transcendence of the self into, into the greater whole. Um, so, you know, whatever form of meditation you take, it's always a tool um, to get to that transcendence. The fifth step here, as we're letting go, um, admit to yourself and another human being the nature of your wrongs, our wrongs, my wrongs. Uh, I think this is this is a critical step. And we can keep all these internal realizations to ourselves, um, but it's when we share them and 
see how we all share in the same thing that, that we can take action together. Um, so by admitting to ourselves that we're addicted to our ego, that we're addicted to being separate from the universe, um, we can see we can see it. We can make it a tangible thing, and we can see how small that really is. You know, uh, that we all share this this thing that keeps us from acting. And uh, I, I think that's a critical step that we don't take off enough. Number six. Be entirely ready to remove all these defects of character. And I think that sounds like a hard thing to do um, when you say it like that. But I think it's not. Um, honestly, I think in the admitting process, uh, you've already gone through most of the steps of removing these, these illusions that, that keep us trapped. Um, and it is something that we have to be constantly aware of, continually aware of, because right at the beginning we admitted that we're powerless. This is an innate trait that we're always going to be given to separating ourselves from nature and from one another. Um, so it's something we have to constantly be striving with. Um, but as it becomes something that we do more regularly, Something that we say, oh, that, you know, I'm not really separated right there. I, I'm, I'm acting selfishly and not even in my own interest, not in the broader interest of everybody, not in the broader interest of the universe. Um, that, that will become habitual and, and easier and easier. Uh, seventh step uh, humbly ask that they be removed. They refers to these illusions, these illusions that trap us. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on, on this one because I think we've sort of been going over the last few steps. Um, number eight make a list of all that we have harmed and be willing to make amends to them all. And uh, this is something that I myself haven't done yet. I haven't gone through my 12-step program, I just wrote it yesterday. Um, I, and this could take some time, it depends how deeply we want to go in, in terms of the harms that we've caused. You know, I, I stand here and, and readily admit that I am an addict to my own ego, um, that I, you know, I put a lot of energy into being an individual, I think we all do. And you'll see individualism in, in the transcendentalist as well, very individualistic um, mentality. Uh, so this is this is a task that could take some time for each one of us. I I know that um, I know that I have some work to do. Number nine. Make amends to such people and things wherever possible. So, you know, once I have this long list of people that I've wronged, um, and probably more importantly, the environment that I've wronged, um, try and make amends. And I think we all make steps to do that here. This is a, a group of, of people who are uh, green, so to speak. Um, and we all know small ways that we can pitch in and reduce our impact on the environment, and we do a very good job. And you know, I, I try my hardest to know that much, um, but we can all do better. And uh, I, I promise to do that. Number ten: Continue to take personal inventory, and when wrong, promptly admit it. This, this again sort of collapses into one of those earlier points. It's a continual process um, to, to think about the transcendent nature of the self and to, and to get outside of your ego. Um, it's something that can be done daily, uh, hourly, by the minute, uh, because 
it is always there, regardless of, of where we're, whether we're trapped in, in the busyness of life. Uh, the universe is always there, it's, and we're always just an extension of it, just as it is an, is an extension of us. And uh, we can always bring that awareness into our life and, and help, you know, help, let it help us be guided. Number 11, seek through prayer and meditation to improve our contact with oneness, praying for understanding. And um, this, this is where I'd like us all to sort of join in a, in a group meditation. And I'll read a, a poem, and I would invite you to, to close your eyes if you're not comfortable with that. I'd like to have a few minutes here, and really just try and let go of illusions, let go of the busyness of everyday life, and, and think about that place where you go out in nature. Maybe you don't go out into nature, but there is some place you go to find peace. I'm quite confident of that. Think about that place. Think about the sound of the waves or the sound of the wind in the trees. And, and we'll go there together. The breeze sprinted ahead of me, jumping from one bent blade of meadow grass to the next. It rushes in green waves that pass hissing and whispering to the edge of the field. If I listen in silence, with Cheshire patience, I can hear the song, but I can never discover the secret of the leaves' words. The song rises and falls, waking inhuman memories of thirsty roots, joyous flowers, and triumphant seeds. It is a silken voice, ancient as wind and grass, yet young with hope and full of life, ageless, soft and sweet. I let the breath of it fill me with stillness, peace. I understand why the willows came here to weep. The tears are ingratitude to eternal beauty.
that first step, just admitting that we're powerless to a degree. But by being continuously aware, or trying to be continuously aware, and by sharing that awareness with others, uh, we, can, we can find a place where we can all, um, we can all take action. Um, there are a couple of quotes that I thought were, were worthwhile from, from Emerson here. And I forgot to mention one earlier uh, that I thought was really for the little bit. Sorry, Emerson. Uh, here's a big quote, though. What lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us. And um, I would even ex expand that. Um, well, just know when he says within us, we should all think about that us being a universal sense. And uh, another quote from Emerson, having come to this place, um, an ounce of action is worth a ton of theory. So I've been up here theorizing quite a bit. Um, and I know I haven't explained it half as well as I should have. But we need, we need to act. Um, there's an existential threat to, to our species. Um, and with the realization that we're all in this together, um, we need to get to, to the state house. We need to, we need to start taking the actions that are going to lead to the real changes. We need to get away from fossil fuel dependency. Um, we need to get away from the idea that we can continually grow on a planet that's finite. Um, and the only way to do that is, is by sharing with each other, acting together. Um, and it all starts with, with simple things, realizing that we're, we're powerless, but that we can, we can do better. I have a uh, final poem I'll read, and this one's actually titled Thoughts of Journey and Quaker Meeting, so I just calls it somewhat appropriate. I want to hold a mirror to your soul, so I may show you what you are. I would reveal the meaning beneath the word God. Can you see the world spinning intricacies around the maelstrom song? A moat in the constellation, circling the black hole at the center of the Milky Way? Our galaxy cartwheeling through dark stretches of space. Can you feel this dancing, waking in your awareness, expanding to the limit of existence, beyond? Can you see that you embody the universe as much as it encompasses us? This reciprocity that makes us one. The patterns that our thought shares with the stars. Behold the mirror of existence and see yourself. The collective moment unified by the spirit of love.